as I was saying, we, we're happy to take your questions throughout. Many of you pre-submitted questions, um, but I know things will pop up throughout the conversation. So as you think of things, feel free to send us a question. There is a chat function that we'd like you to use in order to submit your questions. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little icon that says chat. You just click on that, you type in your question, and we'll begin to take those questions throughout the conversation. Terrific, should we get going? Uh, Let's get going. Looks like the count is still growing a little bit at the bottom, but why don't we get started? First of all, thank you for taking an hour at the end of your day before dinner to join the call. Um, I'm delighted to say this is our third uh, town hall. We'll probably do at least one more before the primary on June 2nd. And we're very open to suggestions on topics. So our first one was on um, crime and public safety. We did a second one on economic development, and now we're doing transportation tonight. Um, the election is coming up, and so I have to encourage everyone to vote. You'll start getting ballots in the mail as early as next week. And we encourage anyone who has any concerns about your registered address to check with the State Board of Elections website to make sure you get that ballot, sign it, and get it in the mail on or before June 2nd. And you could also volunteer on the campaign. We've had great success with people helping us recently with phone banking, texting, picking up yard signs, and that's very helpful as we go into the final stretch here. So let's get to this topic. It's interesting when I talk to people about Baltimore across the spectrum, people feel that transportation is one of the biggest issues holding this city back. And in the five areas I defined in my campaign issues, this was one of the five. We have a city that is really designed for automobiles at the same time that we have at least a third of our residents without access to a car. And in some neighborhoods, that percentage reaches 70%. If you talk to almost any constituency, they're unhappy with our transportation system from a environmental, climate change, air quality perspective, from the equity perspectives of access, cost, and connectivity for people trying to get around the city. People are unhappy about the safety issues for pedestrians, bicyclists, and every other form of transit that's not a car in Baltimore. So it seems that on many dimensions, we are failing in terms of delivering a basic component of a high quality of life in a city, and that is transportation. So that's what I'd like to talk about tonight. In the beginning of the campaign, we put out a issues paper called Making Transportation Work for Everyone. And in that paper, we outlined a few broad themes, the first being more local control over transportation. We're unusual as a large city in having the state run our public transit system. And I think that if Baltimore were to partner with our surrounding counties for a regional transportation authority, we would have a better control over our transportation decisions and could exert much more force in terms of making the changes I think we need to make. I also talked about the need for a strong bus rapid transit system. We can get into that, but it is basically providing more bus lanes, more dedicated streets, more um, rapid, frequent, and more accessible bus service that would particularly work in that east-west corridor that the red line was supposed to serve that is particularly hard for people to transgress in Baltimore. I said we need to make the city safer. We need to finish the complete streets plan, which is currently a resolution, but it needs to be an ordinance. I give a lot of credit to the people that have worked on that over the years, but it's been 10 years since Complete Streets first put out a plan, and I think it's time that we brought that one in for a landing. And I also mentioned the need for students to have greater and more equitable access to public transportation. We give students free bus service for certain hours and for certain distances in the city. But I think it's limiting school choice. And I think it's harming kids that are trying to work or per, per, uh, participate in after school activities or weekend activities. So we wanted more access there. So those are sort of four big issues that we talked about in the beginning. Since launching this campaign, I've talked to so many people and so many groups about transportation issues in Baltimore. And I know that it is not for lack of trying. 
that we are addressing these transportation issues. But I think it's time that we start to get some of these things done. I talked to the Transportation Alliance. I'll show you a few of these things. They give Baltimore a grade of D. This was in 2017. And they were looking at things like access, income, state of repair, reliability, walkability, commuting times, air pollution, physical activity, healthy um, activities, congestion. On every measure, Baltimore was getting a failing grade. And I think if they updated this report to 2020, I don't think the grading would be much different. I also went back and read the transition plan for Mayor Pugh. This was the Transportation Committee. And it's startling how many of the issues raised in that plan five years ago have not changed today. This week, we got the Complete Streets um, Manual was released on Monday. I give, uh, give Councilman Ryan Dorsey a lot of credit for the work that he's put into developing that and pushing that. It still remains a resolution and it's something that the City Council and the Mayor needs to take up and address with a lot of serious attention. So I would get behind Complete Streets. It's a great plan for making our city much more accessible to bicyclists, walkers, scooter users, um, every form of transportation that makes our streets safer and more accessible for people living in the city. I also um, recognize that the state put out in the past month a draft plan for a regional transit plan for Central Maryland. And I give Delegate Brooke Learman a lot of credit for pushing this project. This is a good regional approach for looking at transportation issues. It does not include any recommendation for a regional transportation authority, but I think it's a draft worth looking at in terms of all the ways it approaches our transit system in Baltimore. And they're asking for public comment on January, or rather June 18th. Um, I can't do that before June 2nd, but I plan to comment on this draft after we get through the primary because it's raising a lot of good ideas and important issues. Um, it does point out in the case of Baltimore City, the sheer number of transportation options we have besides driving, we have buses, we have light rail, we have hard rail, we have a water taxi system, we have the Charm City Circulator. None of these things are particularly well connected and they require different fares. And it's a very awkward system sitting on top of our city. And I think we need to think about how we can make this all work better. So I've laid out, you know, sort of my journey in looking into public transportation, what the immediate issues that jumped out at me were in January, taking this on. And then some of the things that I've learned along the way, some of the projects I've looked into along the way. But what I'd like to do this evening is really open this up for questions. Uh, we have some in advance that Spencer can give me, but we'll also be watching the chat room. And I encourage you to put questions in there so I can address them as we go along. I'm going to keep my answers pretty short so we don't get bogged down, but feel free to come back if there's something that you'd like to spend more time on or revisit. So why don't we just get started? Yeah, okay, so for those of you who just joined us, um, I just wanna make remind everyone to make sure that you are muted. That button is in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Just make sure there's a red slash through that. Um, we'll begin with some of the pre-submitted questions, but as questions arise, feel free to drop them in the chat. There is that function. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little box that says chat. Click on that and type your question in there. We'll be taking questions from the chat throughout. So to start, Mary, one of the first questions we have um, is about older adults in Baltimore utilizing public transportation. The question says, I feel like people often overlook the issues for older ad adults facing Base, uh, older adults face navigating transportation for shopping or medical appointments. How do you plan to address the needs of older adults? Having a little trouble hearing you, Spencer, so maybe you can get closer to the mic, but I think I got this question, which was about older residents and how are we addressing their needs? And I think that is a great question as we confront the realities of the demographics of our city and our nation. I, it struck me looking at so many of these plans that um, 
they don't really call that issue out very much. And we know that only 40% of Baltimore city residents live within half a mile of a public transit bus stop or hard rail or access to public transportation. So I think that should be something that we focus on a lot in terms of accessibility, looking at the population in the city and where we need to make sure we have to provide more accessibility. I also think that we need to make sure that all of our forms of transportation are accessible, that we have good access into a bus, into a light rail um, car, that we're thinking about that when we provide public transportation. So I think we can lower some of the bus steps, add some supports to help people who need a little bit more help. But more importantly, we need to think about how are we serving that population? We have an interesting demographic of Millennials who don't seem to want to own cars readily, and we have older people who stop driving. That's really going to bring this issue to the fore in Baltimore, and I think it's a reason why we have to just bear down on our public transit system. Hey, go, you know, visit the whole thing. Can everyone please mute themselves? That kind of would add up because you have a lot of these places that would want to advertise and get a significant amount of money. All right, we'll try to talk over this, let's um, see. There we go. Okay. All right, so Mary, back to our questions. Another pre-submitted question that we had was about your top three transportation projects that you'd like to focus on if you become mayor. Well, I, one thing that's just come up very recently that um, I wanted to air on this hour because I think it might be quite useful this year is introducing in 2020 for the rest of the year a fair holiday. Um, we're going to have a pretty broken economy when we turn the lights back on in Baltimore. After the coronavirus restrictions are lifted, I think we're going to see very significant unemployment. I think we're going to see a lot of um, stress in the city. And I noticed when I was reading the CARES Act legislation, I was looking at the federal dollars that are being given to states for public transportation. And it allows for support for a fair holiday. And I think the city should think about just declaring public transit free for the rest of the year to help people get back on their feet. But I think it would also yeah. give us some really important data and understanding exactly how much of a barrier fares are to ridership and use of the public transit in Baltimore. We do have the Charm City Circulator, which is free, but the bus links, the MTA buses are not. And I, I think that might be something that we should consider. Of course, the new mayor will not take office until January, but I'm gonna propose this idea to the city. Um, the second thing I think is really bearing down on bus service in the city. I've taken the bus around Baltimore, and it is amazing how long it can take to get from point A to point B. So even though the state did a big uh, MTA links project a few years ago, I still am not sure we've got it right in terms of the efficiency of routes and the ability of people to get to you know, work centers, medical centers, commercial centers. I think we need to look at that and get, start working on this you know, bus rapid transit idea, which will provide more speed, more frequency, and more accessibility. The third thing I, I think I would really like to look at is this idea of a regional transportation authority and to secure the funding to do a feasibility study for that. I believe there is support for it in many quarters, but we just haven't made any progress on that. I'm going to add a fourth thing because um, I, okay. huh? you want to talk? The fourth. Um, sure idea would be to to really push the complete streets ordinance which would be a legislative enactment of all of those ideas great so we'll take one more pre-submitted question before we turn to the chat let's look at how does your plan to tackle crosstown transportation the cross tra cross town transportation challenge we seem to have public transit seems to have a decent number of north south routes but getting east to West presents more of a challenge. Improving that would, I believe, meaningfully improve people's work access. Do you agree or am I off base? No, I do agree. And I think it was that East-West access that was the red lines promise for Baltimore. So 
in lieu of that, if we want to do something in the short term, I would think about a dedicated uh, bus street, actually, an east-west bus street. I've been studying maps and I was thinking that Baltimore Street looked kind of promising. I know we already have a bus lane on that street, but think about what New York City has done with 14th Street, where they provide that dedicated bus street that's getting people from east to west and seems to be a great success in that city. I would really like to take a look at that in Baltimore. Great, let's turn to the chat now. Uh, we have a statement from Antonio saying, compared to other cities, especially Washington DC and New York City, Baltimore City subway and light rail is very limited on its to and from destinations. No question there, but let's say, safe to say, how can we improve that? Well, I think that investment in hard rail is very costly and very um, long term in planning. So if we want to do that, that's going to be part of a bigger long term plan for the area. But I agree with you that the, um, the, the routing and destinations are not ideal on our light rail and subway system. And I think that's where we're going to have to fill in the gaps with better bus service, you know, perhaps more creative ideas on ride sharing that can be coordinated with the city's public transportation system, particularly thinking about some of the last mile issues of people getting to a destination. Um, these are not easy issues to solve and they're raised in every transportation plan I look at. But again, I think it's time that we really, you know, sort of buckle down and say, how are we gonna get this done that we really do have um, enough access around the city to get people to work in schools in the places they need to get to. But it'll largely come through the bus system, I think. Another question we have here in the chat says, what are your plans to help push the RTC hike and bike trail loop around Baltimore and the green network connecting it through the neighborhoods? I love that. I'm a bicyclist um, and I have tried to navigate the Greenway Trail and some of the biking um, lanes that are in place today but i just would say let's finish the job i think one reason people are not using biking more consistently is that we have incomplete networks i think it would be great to finish the greenway trail i think it'd be great to finish the dedicated bike lane networks in the city that will really bring people more into the mode of biking once you once someone's once someone is convinced that it's safe and it's complete you can materially increase bike ridership in the city. Another question we have here in the chat is, what, if anything, is the plan to connect the proposed monorail to DC to a larger interior transportation network? That way more of the city could access the DC job market and bring money from there home. Yeah. If that project were to go Further, I think we do need to make sure that it's connected to our train stations and to our light rail system in Baltimore. This is one of the problems, the lack of good connectivity between multimodal transit. And a good plan, I think, would take into account everything that's planned that might be coming with what we have today. But the real issue is being able to go from one type of transportation to another without difficulty. And another idea I'd love to talk to you about and learn more about is whether we could move to some sort of common fare card that could be used interchangeably across these different um, transportation systems. I go to other cities where you can get one fare card and you can use it on the bus, on the subway, on the rail lines. We don't have that here. And I think it's one of the ways we feel disconnected is there isn't this sort of common fare card that we could use. I mean, I, I would love to um, try out this idea of a fair holiday, but maybe we could come back from that with a new way of giving people access that's much more multimodal. Great, now let's jump back to some more of our pre-submitted questions. Um, what would you, would you want to explore again, the feasibility of the red line? Well, I'm certainly open to that. I, feel the disappointment of every single person in Baltimore about that decision. And it is why I keep harping on this 
point that we need to have more local control of transportation decisions. We should not have been surprised by the red line decision. We should have been ahead of that. And I think we need a stronger relationship with the state on transportation planning and financing issues. But I also think if we did have a regional transportation authority, we would have made that call ourselves a long time ago. So if the red line comes back as a proposal, I certainly will support that. I'm disappointed in the years we've lost and the dollars we've lost in not implementing that five years ago. What do you think prevents people from choosing public transit over cars? And what would you do to try and change that? Well, I think right now in Baltimore, if you read the, the list of, of issues, it's basic things like reliability, like frequency, like connectivity, like not being able to get where I need to go. These are basic, basic problems. But let's say that we improve the operations and the efficiency of transit. I think some of it is habit too, of, of getting people to make that shift. Most people don't do the mental math to understand the cost of driving versus public transit. We should help people understand the economics of public transit, what the savings are if you have one less car in your household, um, if you're not paying for insurance and gasoline and so forth. Um, but I, I think it's a combination of things. I think we have to improve the basic quality of service, and then we have to help change people's habits. I've talked in other settings about my strong desire to create more jobs in Baltimore and to promote a live and work in Baltimore plan because only a third of the jobs in Baltimore today are held by people who live in the city. So that means two thirds of the job holders are commuting into the city, creating an enormous amount of congestion and car traffic. If we could put more jobs in the city that are held by people who live in the city, we would be reducing the reliance on cars, ideally creating jobs that are walkable, bikeable, and much more accessible to people living in the city. I think those are some of the things that come to mind in that one. Our next question is, pedestrians and cyclists are killed entirely too often. What is your plan to reduce the number of people injured and killed in traffic every year? The numbers are really shocking. If you look at Baltimore, we have such a disproportionate number of injuries and fatalities relative to our population and other cities. And that's telling me that we have not implemented the safety provisions we need for people to walk and bike in the city. So I think one thing is clearly law enforcement of speeding violations, traffic light violations, thinking about you know, the correct speed limits in the right places to make sure that we don't have traffic that's moving at high speed in areas with um, bicyclists and pedestrians. But I also think if we finish the job in terms of a bike lane network that doesn't have areas that are unfinished and dangerous for bicyclists, if we think about the sort of architecture of streets and safety things we can do like signal priority for bicyclists to turn before cars turn, things like that, um, we could materially you know, reduce some of the safety issues. Some of it is not very high cost. It's simply new um, pavement markings and paintings. Um, I know that many neighborhoods are, you know, get up in arms about these things. And I think that it does require a lot of community engagement and a lot of community work to introduce new ways of transit in neighborhoods and help bring people along so they support things and that they've had their voice and they understand you know, the benefits of this. So um, I, I think we simply haven't made the kinds of investments to complete plans that would make it easier for bicyclists and certainly safer for pedestrians in Baltimore. There's a process around this and we have to honor the process and involve the neighborhoods and communities, but I think that's what we should do. Great. I'm going to hop back over to the chat. Again, if you guys would like to ask a question, please feel free to drop it into the chat box. You can find the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And also just a reminder to make sure that everyone is muted so we don't get that background noise and feedback. 
So the question that we have here in the chat is from Dick, and he is asking, will you talk about the impact of the impact of the estimated $100 million revenue deficit due to Corona on your transportation plans? Anything in particular that we can do without large costs? Mm -hmm. Well, the MTA is the largest funder of public transportation in Baltimore. The city is responsible for streets, highways, bridges, traffic lights. So I think here it's going to be critical to be working closely with the state. There is money in the federal legislation to support local transportation systems and we need to make sure that we're getting every dollar that Baltimore is entitled to um, to support transportation during this period. Um, I also think that the city could, could, could do more with the Department of Transportation. There was a call in um, Catherine Pugh's administration and her transition team to develop a five-year plan. I haven't seen that that five-year plan was completed. I think this might be a good time for the city to start doing that, maybe in advance of moving towards a regional solution. But I think that's the place that I would look at to see how is the city using its budget? How are we deploying funds, particularly the highway user fees that we get from the state? Those monies were cut back after the financial crisis and last recession. They have not reached the level they were at in 2007. But there's flexibility in the use of those funds and I think the city could be um, choosing how to dedicate those funds correctly for, for transportation needs in the city. I'd also like to take a look at all the fees we incur in the city for traffic violations, for parking violations, to see how we are aligning the fees we're collecting that are transportation related with the transportation needs that we're talking about here. But to answer your question, Dick, I, I think this, this question on coronavirus aftermath and funding is largely a discussion we should be having with the state of Maryland. So another question we have here in the chat is a more positive light. What are we doing correctly that needs to be amplified or augmented? According to All Transit, we were a top 10 city in transportation nationwide in 2018, and we fell to 13th in 2019, but that's still pretty high. Well, as I said, I think there's tremendous knowledge about public transit and transportation needs in Baltimore. It is not for lack of good thinking and work on these issues. And I think an example is the complete streets plan, which I think it represents very good work. I still think that I would not give as high marks in terms of implementation of a lot of the ideas um, that have been recommended. And in some cases, not just going the distance to finish something that has been started, but is not in place yet. So I think that's the reason why we might be getting high marks for a good policy and good thinking, but we're not getting very high marks for good execution in other quarters. Well, speaking of complete streets, we did have a pre-submitted question asking if you could explain a little bit more about what the concept of complete streets is. So complete streets is sort of a, I guess I might call it almost a transportation philosophy of thinking about how to use our city streets differently. I began by saying this seems to be a city that's largely designed for automobiles in a population that has a very high percentage of people who don't drive or have access to cars. So I think Complete Streets takes you back to saying, who are all the users of our ways in Baltimore? And how can we design things to be more friendly, to be more hospitable to other forms of transportation? How can we use good design to promote safety, to promote access and equity in the city? How can we make it more livable as a city, particularly for people who want to bicycle or walk to work? I like the, the concept of it in terms of how it thinks about redesigning things in the city for a more, um, I call it 21st century population and for the desires of people who genuinely want to see better air quality, you know, less um, pedestrian uh, fatality, who want safer streets, who want um, more interesting streets, you know, better design using different um, ways to use street art, to use um, 
curbing, to use tree canopy, that we can make the city much more attractive. So I like, I like complete streets from the way it's looking at transportation through a different lens. So I have another pre-submitted question here for you. This one's a little bit long, so bear with me. I am unable to drive because of a medical condition, so I need the bus to get around. In order to get to an appointment that's only a 15 minute drive from my house, I have to allow at least two, sometimes more, hours of transit time. This is in part because of the lack of good routes. I have to take three different buses to get where I'm going and the infrequency of the schedule, but also because I cannot count on the bus to show up at all. Scheduled buses just simply don't appear, so I have to wait for the next one, which itself may be late or a no-show. Sometimes, even with the amount of lead time I have to call, I have to call a ride share and for the last leg because the last of the buses that would get me there on time has failed to arrive and I will otherwise miss my appointment. I'm very lucky to be able to afford a ride share from time to time, but others are not. Also, as I'm looking for a job, I'm limited to employment within walking distance of where I live because I cannot count on the buses to get me to a job every day and on time. How will you fix this? Wow. There's a lot there. Um, but I think that story just illustrates the problems we have in Baltimore. I mean, I'm constantly meeting people who have moved to Baltimore from other cities, and they're shocked at the state of our public transportation system that they simply cannot make it work for them. It's the number one issue that college students raise about Baltimore who've come here from other places. So how will I fix this? I think we come back to the basic premises and we've got to improve the frequency, reliability, and effectiveness of our routing system in Baltimore. I've experienced the same thing, not to the degree of that the person you just read the question from, but I tried to take the bus basically a distance of, um, I guess it was three miles in Baltimore, and it took me almost an hour, including one bus change. And the degree of stress that that can put in someone's life who's trying to get to work or get their kids to school or get to a doctor's appointment, the sort of layering of time they have to build in to allow for all the things they can break down in that journey is just making it so clear this is not working. Um, that's why I think we, we should first start with the bus system, I can come back to that, but we've got to find ways to create more effective, reliable, faster service in Baltimore. And if we need to build in more connectivity between the city's transportation systems, and last mile coverage, perhaps working with ride sharing companies, finding subsidies. I know the city has a program right now to help people in food deserts use Lyft to get to grocery stores, and I applaud that. We, we have to be able to give people access to the basics in life, whether it is grocery shopping, a doctor's appointment, um, just getting your kids to school. I've talked to parents who are unhappy with their school and their neighborhood. And when I've said, well, you have school choice, why don't you send your child to another school that you like better? <laughs> it all comes back to transportation. Say, we cannot rely on the bus system to get our child to school, including transfers, and feel comfortable that they're gonna make it. That's a pretty sad statement. Absolutely. Speaking of schools, uh, Bonnie has a question here in the chat saying, how will you work with city schools and the transportation agencies to promote more direct, secure, and on-time transportation for Baltimore City school children? Yeah, so right now our Baltimore City school children use um, our MTA buses to get to school. I think we should consider some dedicated buses for schools. I, I just think that the reliability issues and the on-time performance is really hard. I also talk to students who frequently lose their bus passes. That's why I think it might be good to find a different way for kids to access the bus system. If, well, I, I, there, there shouldn't, it shouldn't be the case that they have to pay $5 every time they lose their bus pass and have to get it replaced. So I, I think dedicated buses, working with the school system and the MTA, again, this is the state working with the city agency well to get something done 
would be a good thing to look at. I also mentioned at the beginning that I think that the current allowances for students to go a certain distance within certain hours are too restrictive. I would just open that up so kids who need to stay after school or have um, internships or work study arrangements, we should just open that up so there are no barriers to um, access to transportation for students. There's a question about the MTA and its relationship with the state. Um, William is asking, is there a starting point for taking control over regional transport at MTA? The revised routes they implemented seem to have been a mixed bag in terms of effectiveness. If they want to retain control over the MTA, then what will we be able to do in terms of pushing them to integrate rails more fully across the city? Implementation seems to be much worse than the ideas from the MTA of late. Mm -hmm. Well, I would come back to the first step, which would be to find the funding, and maybe this is from philanthropy, to do the feasibility study of what a regional transportation system could look like, to work with our surrounding counties. You know, transportation doesn't stop at the city's borders. It's got to be regional. But let's do the study first and see what it would take to create a regional transportation authority and you know, what relationships with the state remain in place or change. Um, I think this is definitely worth pursuing. So I would work to find the funding to at least begin the study to look at this and see how we could transition. From our pre-submitted questions, we have a question about the Charm City Circulator. How does it fit into your transportation plan? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question because the Charm City Circulator, as I understand it, was originally designed to help people access the core central business district and activities around the Inner Harbor without having to park downtown, but be able to access um, some of the, the highlights of the city through this free bus system. It was originally funded with federal funds and is now funded by the city. It has five different routes in the city, um, much of which has been criticized as serving the more affluent parts of the city and not some of the most needy parts of the city. So we have this odd situation, which is the city-run free bus service that sits on top of the MTA's bus service and sometimes even has duplicative routes with the MTA and is not arguably serving the people who need it the most. We're not providing free bus service to the people who may need it the most. So I think the term city circulator needs a refresh. We need to look at it, think about how it fits into the broader city transportation system, but also think about how can we be using it differently if we want to have free bus service in the city, who should it be serving and what neighborhoods should it be accessing? I mean, I'd really like to do the work to see where the most inaccessible places in the city are and how much transportation we're putting into those areas right now. That, that's data, that's a project, but it's certainly a knowable thing. And I think the Charm City Circulator needs to be integrated into a broader plan for Baltimore. What about this question? Should employers end parking subsidies? Would you support helping them negotiate with the MTA to give employees subsidized MTA passes? I think for starters, we should begin making that an option right now. Um, I imagine there would be a lot of resistance to taking away parking subsidies at the outset, but at least we should begin with a plan with options and give people the choice of an MTA pass versus a parking subsidy. And maybe we can make the MTA pass more valuable than parking. I say this with a lot of um, reservations, thinking about parking revenues for the city and what we will be giving up if we don't do that. But the city is certainly paying out of pocket to give these parking subsidies to its own employees. I guess we need to have a broader plan for thinking about how we can incent more use of public transit through MTA passes in a way that's fiscally responsible at the same time. But I think we need to start moving in that direction. Christopher's asked in our chat, um, Baltimore used to be a streetcar town and much of the existing roads are former streetcars, streetcar lines. 
Given the success DC and other cities have had with their streetcar lines, are you willing to try that in Baltimore? To some degree, we have tried that with above ground light rail. It's interesting when I drive around Baltimore, some of the road repairs I know to look like it's the old streetcar lines that are collapsing in the streets and coming back to the fore. Um, I think we should look at anything that would work in the city as good public transit. Streetcars and light rail are far less costly to build than hard rail. Um, if it works within the context of, of the bus system that we have, the route system that we need, we, could, we should certainly look at it. Dick has also asked, what's your thinking about traffic lights timing to flow through to parking destinations? For example, smart lights. Well, Dick, you could probably educate me more about smart lights, but I think we do have an outdated street, uh, I mean, uh, camera, a street um, light uh, system that I know is being updated. Um, I'm not sure whether you're asking about getting that to work more optimally for traffic flow or whether you're trying to calm traffic speed by using lighting times differently. Um, but I, I, on that one, I'll probably regress to you to say, help, help me understand what you are getting at with that question. We'll watch for it in the uh, chat room. <laughs> um, another one of our pre-submitted questions speaks to inequity. And it says that there are too many inequities in Baltimore's public transit. Poor neighborhoods and neighborhoods with people of color lack access to good transit and green space. How are you going to address these inequities? Again, I think it comes back to really doing the work to understand who does not have access. How can we improve access? And at the same time, address some of the other inequities in Baltimore. We have written about, we have followed the public health inequities in the city, which have really been brought to the fore by the coronavirus. We know what the air quality problems are in Baltimore. We know how that affects people who have asthma and the rates of asthma in Baltimore are off the charts relative to norms. This is something that we can really tackle pretty holistically if we can improve the transportation system in the city, if we can reduce reliance on cars, if we can put more jobs in neighborhoods where people can walk to work. Um, I think there's so, a lot of synergy in thinking about some of the inequities with transportation. I'm sure most people are aware there was a report coming out of Harvard in 2015, which said transportation is the single biggest obstacle to mobility out of poverty which most people would not have picked as the most important variable. And you know, it's one study, one piece of work. But I do think that if we wanna tackle poverty and inequity in Baltimore, I think transportation is a good place to start. Mm. So we have a pre-submitted question that's kind of similar to one of our chat questions. So I'll kind of give you them both. Um, the pre-submitted question is, can you give DOT more funding? And Tim has added here in the chat and says, the feds have not been very good at funding urban transportation projects and the state of Maryland is not strongly inclined to fund transportation in the city as the state is more suburban and highway focused. Are there creative financing tools that we could use to build bus rapid transit in Baltimore? Mm -hmm. Well, I think as a city, we're gonna have to look at the budget and say, what are our priorities? We have already tackled education with the Kerwin Commission recommendations, and I support those. I think that we need to spend more on public health, particularly in emergency preparedness. Um, I'm hopeful that as we tackle our crime issues in Baltimore, we can spend less on public safety, which is the largest source of expenditures in the budget, and give ourselves more room to spend on other priorities. I talk a lot about an economic development plan for Baltimore, bringing in a deputy mayor for economic development, making that a front office priority. And I think that if we are successful in really driving job growth in Baltimore and raising income in Baltimore, I think then we can begin to address some of the spending needs we have for the city. It is absolutely critical that we improve our tax base and improve the income 
in the city in order to be able to pay for the things that we know we need to do. Um, but poor people spend a disproportionate amount of their income on transportation. That's why I think it is a very important issue for Baltimore to tackle. And I think to the extent we can do more locally to fund transportation projects, particularly the operating needs of the system, I think that's where the city's priorities should be. We're looking to the state for a lot of the capital projects and the federal government to a certain degree. That program looks underfunded relative to the needs. It's another reason why we need to work hard with the state to make sure that we can get the capital improvements that we need to make in transportation. So also in the chat, you're being asked if your plans for transportation vary with significance from other mayoral candidates, or is it more of a matter of emphasis or priority? Mm -hmm. Well, I sat in one transportation forum with a number of the other candidates, and I certainly heard um, strong support for things like the Complete Streets program. I don't think anyone else was talking about a regional transportation authority, which I do think is a, something I would support and I'd like to see here. Um, I also think that I've probably dug deeper into the numbers looking at things like the highway user fees and how they could be repurposed in Baltimore, how we might be able to use federal aid differently in Baltimore. Um, but I, I would say that every candidate recognizes that we are not where we need to be in terms of transportation issues in Baltimore. And there are varying levels of sophistication in the proposals that I've heard, but the important thing is to put someone in place, put a mayor in office, who's gonna get some things done. It, I, I'll say what I said at the beginning, which is I'm really struck by the number of plans, the number of proposals, the number of unfinished business in this area that is not for lack of good thinking and not for lack of good intentions, but we simply have not been able to move the needle on a number of these things, and I think it's time. So Lisa is asking how supportive you are of technology that would be open to progressive options to in introduce better transportation modalities. For example, if Elon Musk wanted to build a hyperloop and connect Baltimore to other cities, would you support this? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think that we need to um, be as smart as we can in using technology and thinking about new ways that um, we can get more efficient, more productive. Um, I think that that connectivity issue is part of her question and how we are helping people in Baltimore connect to um, other modes of transit and particularly looking at our position on the East Coast, we should be very open to that. So Lisa has another question. She admits that this may not be solely transportation focused, but certainly related to transportation infrastructure. She's noticed a lot of construction and road work and sees roads that are freshly paved only to be then torn up by BGE or D DPW. Why does this keep occurring and can you help better coordinate these ser services to reduce city costs? I think that is a glaring example of poor management and inefficiency. We should not be doing that and I'm certain that it is costly. And I think that's a case of again, you know, leadership on coordination, working with our utilities, working with every um, utility provider, whether it's BG&E or others, to make sure that if we are tearing up a street, we're taking care of all of our issues at one time. But that, takes, that does take a, a certain degree of planning and coordination. And that's the sort of problem I like to solve. So we only have a few minutes left. I have a few more questions from our pre-submitted questions that I'd like to get through, and then I'll hand it over to you to close. Um, the last couple questions are, removing on-street parking is normally necessary to build dedicated bus lanes and bike lanes, but as we know, it can be controversial. As mayor, what would your policy be? Mm -hmm. Well, I do support in certain parts of the city putting in place bus lanes that can move people faster across some congested parts of the city. And if that eliminates parking places, we've got to find the solution for that. It's really a matter of working with the affected parties and saying, how can we solve this problem? We want to do this. We need to provide more frequent access, more reliable bus service. 
if we're going to take parking places off the street, we need to have a solution of what the, where that's going to go and how we can get agreement from people to do that. So I, I think it is really a community engagement issue because I think, you know, the resistance to this is from people who don't have a solution in hand. They don't know what's going to happen. So I think that we need to get in front of that and have the whole package before you put something like that in place. Great. The last question I have for you, Mary, is what incentives do we create to help Baltimore be less automobile dependent? Mm -hmm. Well, I touched on a few of them during this hour, but I think Helping people, first of all, understand the economics of a car versus other transportation options is useful. I don't think people usually do the mental math of car ownership versus alternatives. But first and foremost, we have got to provide a better option. And that means investing in public transit so people have something they can count on and that they believe in. There's some relatively simple things I think we could do to make things better in the short term as we develop a longer term plan. You know, something like a simple fare card that worked on every mode of transportation in Baltimore, whether it is a water taxi, a bus, a light rail, or um, uh, a charm city circulator, which is currently free. Um, we could do things like that that begin to knit together the pieces of our transportation system. We could finish the Complete Streets program. I think there, there are things we can do to make people make changes in their lives that will alter the reliance on cars in the city. And the overarching point, I would say, is I would really like to pursue a live and work in Baltimore plan to create more jobs in the city held by people who live in the city and to reduce the amount of commuting that's coming into Baltimore because we have put in place jobs that people can get to without the use of a car. Well, that's all the questions that I have, Mary. Before I hand it over to you to close it out, I just want to remind everyone that we will have a recording of this call that you are welcome to share with friends who may not have been able to attend. The recording will be available on Mary's social media and on her website, electmarymiller.com. If you want to receive it in your inbox, along with all our other updates, you can also subscribe to our newsletter there um, and sign up to volunteer if you are so inclined. Uh, the only other reminder I'd like to give you all is that there will be a debate on Tuesday on WBAL at 7 p.m. I encourage you guys to tune in. I know someone did message me asking me about that, so I wanted to let you know. And other than that, Mary, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, these have been great questions. I've been trying to read the chat room as we've been talking and I can tell there's some deeply knowledgeable people about transportation issues in Baltimore. And I would just leave you by saying that I recognize that this is an issue that's holding our city back. And the next mayor has got to take control of this issue and say, we're going to finally get some things done and make Baltimore a much easier city to navigate a much easier city for people to be healthy in, a much easier city for people to um, take advantage of every mode of transportation. So I thank you for joining, for listening, for asking such great questions. And I assure you that this is something that I would take um, a lot of pride in changing in Baltimore and making sure that we are turning this city into a extremely attractive place for people to get around. So uh, thank you for joining. And um, I think, Spencer, you've done all the heavy lifting here. Thank you, Spencer, for doing this. And we'll let you know what the next uh, subject of our town halls will be soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.